Welcome to this episode of our new look and format Brexit Business Show, coming to you now in both video and audio format. I'm your host, Malcolm Gallagher. Now, we're recording this the day after Liz Truss resigned as PR, uh, PM, UK Prime Minister. <laughs> At 44 days, the shortest serving PM in UK history. In point of fact, one of the newspapers, the Daily Star, has reckoned that um, a lettuce lasts longer than Liz trust. These are serious times, though, in the UK economy, and Brexit is having serious and negative impact. It seems to me that politicians are more interested in their own careers than the lives of the people they represent. I have a feeling that this show may have some cutting remarks on that. In today's show, Hugh Morgan Williams brings you his digest, Hugh's News. Now, don't be surprised if the word resignation features a few times. Then Hugh and myself will have a news chat about a topical item from the news, which seems at the moment to be the buzzword, and that is stability. My Malcolm's monologue will give you some more thoughts and ideas on Thrival. And following that comes our brand new feature, Focus On, where we take a country each episode and talk about the business opportunities and challenges in that country. And this focus, this one episode, it's Focus On Poland. And the final segment, as in all our Brexit business shows, is our editorial comment called Hughes Views. I have a feeling it's not going to be great. So let's get the show started with introducing Hugh and Hughes News. This week, a row of migration appears to be behind the Home Secretary's snap resignation which has also triggered the resignation of our shortest ever Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Britain's economic chaos is increasingly blamed on Brexit. Ryanair boss Michael O'Leary said as much this week, while the Financial Times has released a powerful film showing the effect on the economy since 2016. The post-Brexit trade deal with India is on the verge of collapse because of Suella Braverman's comments about overstaying Indian migrants on student visas, And new figures show UK trade with the EU down 16%, whilst EU trade with UK is down 20%. Two weeks ago, we reported on an apparent division between the then Prime Minister and the Home Secretary over migration. The PM had said she wanted migration rules relaxed to stimulate growth and relieve worker shortages in a number of areas, including hospitality and agriculture. This was in direct conflict with the Home Secretary, who had already said she was planning to tighten migration rules to restrict immigration into Britain. Yesterday, that argument boiled over with its reported a shouting match between the two before news of the Home Secretary's resignation broke. The rows apparently already claimed one other casualty, the putative trade deal with India. This was always going to have some element of immigration at its heart, with India wanting student and work visas relaxed. Until there's more certainty over this issue, it's unlikely the Anglo-Indian trade deal will go anywhere soon and see the light of day, or indeed any other policy, until the leadership of the Conservative Party is settled. The increasing chaos is deeply destabilising, and there is concern that economic volatility will increase as a result. There are claims this week that Britain's current economic chaos has its roots in Brexit. There's been thinly veiled delight among left-wing politicians, both in America and Europe. Some commentators have drawn parallels with Italy, where leaders change with the weather. And how's Brexit going? Tweeted Guy Hofstadt, who runs the Liberal Alliance in the European Parliament. He maintains the instability started in 2016, something that former Chancellor George Osborne agrees with. He said this week that Britain's political class is living in unreality, failing to understand the scale of the economic decline since Brexit. This is borne out by new figures this week showing the scale of the decline in trade. Research has revealed that UK trade with the EU is down 16%, whilst trade the other way into Britain is down 20%. The influential Financial Times has released a powerful film this week charting that decline. Entitled The Brexit Effect, it argues that Brexit is a huge act of self-harm, putting ideology ahead of pragmatic economic management. It ultimately argues that every citizen is substantially poorer than before as a direct result. 
Increased bureaucracy, goods stuck in warehouses and food exports rotting in queues have become commonplace. European customers stop buying from the UK and increasingly British exporters have reinvented themselves, establishing new distribution networks by establishing subsidiaries and warehouses in Europe, thus bypassing large volumes of bureaucracy and administration made necessary by leaving the single market. Two other stories in brief. A leading London law firm, Bates Wells, says plans to scrap all retained EU law by the end of the year are dangerous and undemocratic. And a new poll says 58% of the public want to forge new relationships with the EU. Thanks, Hugh. Now, during the uh, Hugh's um, news there, Hugh mentioned that film by the Financial Times. Both of us think it's a very powerful film, and we'd like to encourage you to, to see it, watch it. So coming on the screen now is a QR code that you can scan from the screen to take you straight to the YouTube video of Financial Times. And also along the bottom of the screen, you will find the bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, linked to it. Now, for listeners, let me just read you out that bit.ly. It's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash 3-F-5-K- Q E N three F five K Q E N. Thanks, you. It's time for our news chat. Now, around the world, stability is what everyone's clamoring for. But in a world of constant change and uncertainty, and with matters outside our control, such as Ukraine, can stability be ever achieved? Or if it can, to what level? And, and anyways, what is stability? Well, Malcolm, I think that's a, that's a really good question. I think it's, in short, it's what we haven't got now. <laughs> yes. Um, it is the polar opposite to chaos. Um, chaos is, is exciting, but it's also very dangerous. Um, stability is, um, I think, over, around the world at the moment, quite less, less normal. There is more chaos than there is stability. So stability probably means boring, um, but I think most people in the UK at the moment would prefer boring to the alternative that we have now. Um, stability means being able to plan for the future. Stability means um, having relationships which will last. Stability means uh, an economy that is predictable rather than unpredictable. Uh, stability means uh, companies being able to set their prices in the knowledge that they will get value when they sell the goods attached to those prices, rather than at the moment, it's a bit thumb in the air type of uh, uh, economics where, well, we're hoping for the best. So I suppose in a way, stability is what we desperately need. But you're right to ask, what is stability? It is, I suppose, at its heart, um, having a government that lasts more than 47 days. <laughs> Um, or the length of a, or the life of a lettuce, yes. or the life, or indeed the life of a lettuce, or a savoy cabbage. Yes, um, I mean, you know, what life did Quasi Quateng had? I think it was even shorter than a lettuce, wasn't it? So, yes. I, I think there is the, the, what people in this country are crying out for is is stability. We want stability in energy prices. We want mm. stability in. Um, our grocery shop, I mean, I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, when you go to the supermarket, every time you go, something's gone up. And it's yes. not my odd penny either. It's, no. you know, bread. I mean, I went into my local branch of a well-known supermarket yesterday and found bread had gone up 30 pence a loaf for a small loaf. Yeah. You know, and that is something which we're having to take on board. So it's not surprising we read that food inflation is exceeding 14%. And it, that, in a sense, is because of the international backdrop to the war in Ukraine. It's also down to the economic decisions that this government took mm. some weeks ago, which led to vastly increased interest rates. I mean, I was talking to uh, one of my children last night, and um, one of them has been fortunate, um, and they've been able to fix their mortgage at 2.1% for five years. Um, and they did that long before all this all this happened. Uh, my other daughter is facing an increase of a much more modest mortgage um, of £200 a month from February, which she can't afford. 
Mm. And, you know, it's these it's these kinds of impacts. Um, I, I had a row with my energy provider last week. <laughs> they said, well, I mean, they'd said, they said, oh, your direct debit needs to go up um, more than doubled. And when I challenged it, they instantly, without even looking at the figures, gave me 15% off. Yes. That's not stable. It's not yeah. reliable. You know, I am not the energy supplier's banker. But that is what is happening in, in life at the moment. All relationships are up in the air. Um, mm. All professional relationships are up in the air. Yes. All your relationships with your normal suppliers, your you know village shop, whatever you, you know, local supermarket, it's all up in the air. And the trust that exists—it's a corrosive effect. The trust that has been there, yes, isn't that's it there anymore. Mm. And and I suppose again, the the the, the definition of stability is a relationship that breeds trust not distrust yes. and uh, I, I think the prime minister has had probably a rather an unfortunate word an unfortunate name trust is 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 trust and it's 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 you know we should be able to trust our leaders and our politicians we should be able to trust our suppliers we should be able to trust um loads of people we actually interact with but it's very very it's very very difficult now to do that so my definition of stability is an atmosphere of trust that engenders proper and sensible decision making which lasts excellent you thanks for that clarity around stability um i just think though don't hope for it before the end of 23 in many cases but we had the same situation where, where our energy provider wanted to triple our triple our co cost you know and uh my wife, who's there, says, no. And they said, oh, OK. <laughs> you know, and it, it was just a, a question of exploiting us. And I'll tell you what, it's some other people have been doing it and they're losing our custom. And I think that's where a lot of other people start to do. Thanks, you. And now for my pre-recorded Malcolm's monologue. My monologue today is how to win during uncertainty. Uncertainty is the new norm and will continue for many years to come. So coming up are three strategies to help you win during that uncertainty. Action number one, embrace change. Change the way you think about uncertainty. You know change is coming, it's the only constant, but it's scary. If you want to succeed, set your attitude mindset that uncertainty brings opportunity. It brings new markets, new ideas. So perceive it not as a problem, but an opportunity for you to accelerate growth and achieve thrival. Number two, be curious, have 2020 vision, predict your future by creating it. You know it's coming, so don't wait for it. Invest your time to see it coming. Get talking about the changes happening outside of your industry. What is happening with the economy? Where are the new technologies? And how will they impact your industry? What's changing with customers and has changed? Who and where are your new competitors? Taking this action gives you room to prepare, see change coming, and importantly, see opportunity. Now, if you choose to ignore it, you lose. And number three is build your team talent. It's likely that the key differentiator from you and your competitors is the team that's around you. No, it's not your brand, not your product, not your service. It's your team. It's the customer experience of your team and your reputation in the marketplace. The best companies have leaders whose passion is developing, investing in, and building their teams. So, reflection. Let's agree that uncertainty is the new frontier that's here now, and change is needed to manage it. Are you up for it? It's time now for our new feature, Focus On. And in this episode, it's Focus on Poland. Hugh, Poland is a friend of the UK, 
with some great and affordable Ryanair flights to various airports, including the University City of Wroclaw. So where do you think the business opportunity lies in, in Poland? Well, I happen to know Poland quite well. I mean, I started going to Poland in 1992, just after the, 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 the Berlin Wall came down. And at that point, Poland was emerging from the great shadow of Russia and the USSR. And, for example, when I first went there, I mean, this, this Lottie had uh, um, inflation running at about um, 150%. And so whilst I was there, the exchange rate moved several times. And people much preferred accepting United States dollars than yeah. any other currency. So the, 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 the dollar was the stable currency in Poland when I started going there. But I was struck when I first went how diligent and hardworking the Poles were, how friendly they were uh, towards Brits in particular, uh, and how they refused to speak Russian. I mean, Russian, yes. Russia was the second language in Poland. It is no yeah. more. Um, and 30 years ago, um, the Poles took the decision that they were no longer going to teach Russian in schools. Um, and they were teaching English instead. So a lot of people actually have quite good English in Poland as a result. And, and every time I've been there, I've been welcomed with open arms and have been able to establish business relationships really quite easily. Um, in contrast with some of the other Eastern European countries who wow. were perhaps uh, a little work shy at times um, and a little less um, trustworthy in terms of their, their, their business dealings. But with Poland, I always found that you could rely on them. I can remember I, I appointed a, a, an agent in Poland um, who had a wonderful name. He was called Magic, and he was able he was able to 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 um, um, create wonders in in many ways. He also organised all our exhibitions and, and foreign trips in Poland. Um, he also had a, a model agency with some of the most beautiful girls in the country. Um, so he was always able to provide interpreters who. <laughs> not only spoke the language, but looked the part as well. Um, so Magic was great in establishing uh, my company's presence in, in the country. And it, and it went from strength to strength. I mean, to give you a couple of figures, I think we, we started off at absolutely rock bottom, nothing. Within two years, we were doing £300,000 worth of business in Poland. Wow. So it, was a, it really was a great success. And I, and I got to know the country quite well. And one of the things that struck me is that the whole attitude in Poland was towards learning. They had great universities and always had had, even when they were under the control of, of the Soviet Union. And all the entrepreneurship that existed in Poland existed in the universities under these professors who established all sorts of wonderful companies um, which sort of took over their lives. So they tended to sort of retire from university and then become uh, great businessmen. And, and this is why Poland still today has a growth rate of about 5.7%. It's 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 really it's quite amazing to see, and they've established a, a stable currency. They've established um, a, a, an EU track record, which is um, the envy of, of many in, in in Eastern Europe. And of course, now um, they're they're very keen on European integration as a buttress to the war in the war in Ukraine. So there are lots of opportunities in Poland. Um, I mean, for example, if you look at what we import from them now, it's um, things like um, fruit and veg and dairy, it's a lot of agricultural produce, um, specialist meats and things like that, furniture. Um, and surprisingly, um, boats. There are, there are lots of shipyards making international yachts and, and small boats in Poland, and, and they're very well made. Also, some white goods, some kitchen appliances, and so on. So they've got a they've established a, a really good industrial base. And in terms of what we sell to them, well, we talk about non-ferrous metals, specialized machinery, a lot of cars, and a lot of vehicles. Uh, we sell to Poland. We export something like six point four billion a year to Poland, and we import thirteen and a half billion. So you know, this country really values its trade with Poland. Um, it's the twenty fifth largest export market for the UK and it's the 16th largest trade partner so you know there's a lot going for trade with Poland and a lot of opportunity um, and I would frankly recommend people who are looking to expand to look at Poland uh, and, and see what they come up with. 
Yeah, and with those low-cost flights, you can go there and explore. And um, one thing that I found uh, with about Poland, where my son-in-law and daughter have just come back from a, a three-year um, exercise there opening a new business uh, in the recycling, they're extremely interested in recycling, environmental aspects. And, you know, we've got a, in the UK some great products that can help. Now, Hugh, I know yeah, we've been... Just one, just one other thought, and that is that when I started going to Poland, um, it took six months to get a telephone line. Right. Um, well, what did Poland do about that? They junked their landlines and they opted mm. for mobile. So literally in 12 months when I went back, everyone had a phone. And they're all chatting away and doing business. And their ability to actually seize opportunities, I think, are, are, yeah. is really interesting. Yes. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, I know we've been very serious so far, you. So let me just um, uh, lighten the, the subject matter by telling you a story about, um, you know, M from uh, the James Bond films? Absolutely. Yes. Well, she, she made a con. Ah, M. It's M here, Bond. Now, Bond, I want you to go to Warsaw and I'd find a man called Stanislav and ask him, when will he come back to finish my kitchen? Yeah. Well, I could, and, I could, and, I could and, learn to tell. I'll learn to tell it better next time here. Well, um, maybe, but I mean, it's in fact, you make an interesting point. I mean, there is a very large Polish community in the UK. Without a doubt. Burton on Trent in particular. Mm. Yeah. Well, all yeah. over it. And that's yeah. why, you know, even if you go into Tesco, I mean, there, there is a, an, a, an aisle in our local Tesco, um, which has Polish at the top. Now, yes. initially, I thought that was all to do with Polish. But of course, it's not. It's Polish, Polish delicacies, yes. <laughs> which, which the, um, the Polish community uh, around us uh, use. Um, and, and some of them are very good, too. Yeah, I like some of the Polish beers and, um, and things like that. Now, as always, no Brexit show would be complete without our, to the point, Hugh's view. Now, there's something not great about it this episode. Well, I don't know about you, but I certainly didn't expect the chaos that's affecting our country to get worse. But I'm afraid it has. Leaving aside the personalities, we've not had an effective government since July, when the former leadership contest kicked off. And we won't have another one for a fortnight at least. So are we becoming the laughing stock, not just of Europe, but the world? Certainly international comments seems to imply that they're not taking us seriously anymore. We need certainty for business to plan. We have none. We need leadership for stability, which we were talking about earlier. We have none. We need respect from international partners to forge and strengthen relationships. We have none. It's no wonder that Russia welcomes the departure of Liz Truss. It's no wonder that in this febrile and chaotic environment, it's reported Boris Johnson may run again. The film from the Financial Times is a must-watch this week, mm. as it puts our present deeply depressing position within the Brexit perspective. Tolerant, law-abiding, generous and safe, with a reputation won over centuries. I'm afraid the adjective great has taken leave of its senses, and I fear it will be many years before I can refer to Britain in such a way again. Wow, powerful thinking there, Hugh. Very powerful thinking, um, especially coming from somebody so committed, committed to the UK uh, as you are. We trust you've enjoyed this episode of our Brexit show format. There's a new episode every fortnight, and next time our focus on country will be south africa thanks for watching or listening do get in touch with us mg at bizvision.co.uk mg at bizvision.co.uk if you would like us to cover any subject bye for now <laughs>